Disney has been making movies for nearly a century, and most of those films have become childhood classics and fan favorites. Now, of course, every movie has its ups and downs, but today, we're only going to be talking about the ups and the good things we love about each of these movies. Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and this is one thing we love about every Disney animated movie. All right, a couple of notes. First, spoilers. Sure, some of these are classics that everyone has seen, but some are newer films that people haven't touched yet. Second, we're not going to be talking about third-party company movies like the Bob's Burgers movies, Pixar films, animation live-action hybrids like Fantasia or Who Framed Roger Rabbit, or straight-to-video films like most of the sequels. Finally, if a film is unable to be watched easily, whether that be because they're only found on DVDs or aren't on Disney Plus or other streaming services, like Make Mine Music and a lot of the late 40s package films, we won't be including them, at least this time. With that out of the way, we can get started talking about what we love about these Disney animated films. First is 1937 Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. The thing we love about this film is its record-breaking status. Snow White is an iconic film for a million reasons, whether it's the songs or the story or its many iconic quotes. However, what really sticks out is how important this film is to Disney and animation as a whole. It's the first traditionally animated full-length feature film, the highest-grossing animated film when adjusted for inflation, and was one of the first 25 movies preserved in the National Film Registry. Without this film, most people's favorite films would never exist, and that makes it iconic. The next film is 1940's Pinocchio. Pinocchio is a strong second film, and what we love most about it is its dark plot. If you were to rewatch Pinocchio nowadays, you'd notice how immensely dark it actually is. Not only the general plot of Pinocchio being tricked at every turn, or him and Geppetto being eaten by a giant whale, but the darkest plot is obviously the Coachman and Pleasure Island, turning young boys into slave laborers as donkeys. Every bit of this is dark, and we absolutely love it, even if we may not have understood it the first time. Next is Dumbo from 1941. Our favorite thing about Dumbo is honestly the relationship between Dumbo and his mother. While there's not too much to love about this film, this movie happens to be before the long and fabled history of Disney killing off all the main character's parents. Dumbo's relationship with his mother, Mama Jumbo, is uniquely lovely, and honestly one of the best things in the film, especially considering how poorly it's aged in other places. Next is 1942's Bambi. The best part of Bambi and the part we love the most is Bambi's friendships. Bambi is a movie that makes you very sad in the beginning, and then brings you to a happier place when you meet Bambi's friends, Thumper and Flower. Being an ecstatic and jumpy rabbit and a shy skunk respectively, they're some of the best characters in the film. In fact, considering how sad the beginning is, having these cute friendships throughout the meat of the film makes it much better. Next is the 1948 musical package film, Melody Time. The thing we love the most about this film is the main premise, its sheer variety. Melody Time, like Fantasia and the other package films released to finance the more popular 50s movies, is full of many different plots, songs, and ideas that would have been left on the cutting room floor otherwise. Each of the segments are filled with great ideas and are all different enough to keep your attention for that long, hence why we enjoy it. The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad from 1949 is next. The thing we love most about this is very specifically The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which is the second of two stories in this film. While The Legend of Sleepy Hollow has had plenty of adaptations, this version is considered quite the cult classic. It's full of intense moments that are surprising to see, and while the jokes aren't a major part, they do add enough comedy to keep you on your toes. While the Wind and the Willow story is considered more iconic, having its own Disneyland ride, we like the Sleepy Hollow story much more. Next is 1950's Cinderella. While this movie is very iconic, we think the thing we love most is actually Lady Tremaine. While we won't be talking about the sequels, which are hilarious, in the first Cinderella, Lady Tremaine is a perfect example of an early Disney villain who's terrifying despite her small screen time. You clumsy little fool! Clean that up. She makes such an impression in her time on screen that she very easily takes the cake as the best part of this film. Now we have 1951's Alice in Wonderland. It's no surprise that we find aesthetics as our favorite thing. Alice in Wonderland is weird because it's similar to the 40s package films because it doesn't stay in one place for very long. Each of the places are amazingly designed. With so much variance, it's hard not to love it. Absalom, the Mad Hatter, the Carpenter, and everything in between, not staying in one place for too long keeps it fresh. 
which is why we love it. Next is 1955's Lady and the Tramp. What we really love about this film is its story. Like Dumbo, there's not a lot of things we really love about this film. However, we enjoy the story. While the plot features a lot of similarities to other films and stories like Romeo and Juliet, we think it's a very nice plot with lovely characters, save for a couple, and plenty of good moments, especially the ending. Finishing up the 50s films, we have Sleeping Beauty from 1959. By far, the thing we love most about this film is Maleficent. Sleeping Beauty doesn't have a lot going for it, most of it is boring. However, this isn't the case when Maleficent sashays on screen. Every scene she's in is god tier. She makes the movie bearable because she's by far one of the most iconic villains in film. Maleficent is the best part of this movie, which is why she got her own movies. On to the 60s. 1961's 101 Dalmatians. What we love about this, much like the previous, is the main villain, Cruella de Vil. While there's a lot of things to love in this movie, from the iconic song to the dark plot about skinning puppies, by far the best part is Cruella. She is intensely evil and so full of dark energy that she commands every scene, even if she doesn't have much time on screen as we may like. Up next is The Sword and the Stone from 1963. While this film is underrated, the thing we love most about it is the iconic wizard duel scene. It happens near the end of the film when Merlin and Madame Mim have a powerful duel between two amazingly powerful wizards. The sheer creativity throughout the scene and the amount of different things they do make it intensely entertaining to watch, hence why we love it. Moving forward to 1967, we have The Jungle Book. What we love most about it is its music. The Jungle Book features at least three iconic songs that some people still listen to on a daily basis. Trust in Me, The Bare Necessities, and I Wanna Be Like You are all songs we enjoy immensely, and definitely help perk up the film, which gets quite slow in spots. Each of these songs are fun to listen to, or at least nice to sing along with. 1970's The Aristocats is next. What we love most is Thomas O'Malley and his role in the film. Thomas O'Malley is one of the main cats in the film, being an alley cat who helps the kittens get back to Duchess later on. He's one of the best characters and he eats up every scene he's in, much like characters we've mentioned before, and this makes it a very easy choice. Next, going to 1973, is Robin Hood. Of the many great things in this movie, the thing we love about it is its comedy. Comedy is very subjective, but even critics at the time note its comedy as a selling point. Sure, it may not be as funny as Robin Hood Men in Tights or as intense as other Robin Hood adaptations, but we find the film very funny, full of life and fun, which we love. Next is 1977's The Mini Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. To no one's surprise, the thing we love about it is the characters. Ever since this first film, we've been introduced to some of the most iconic characters in Disney's repertoire. From Pooh to Tigger to Eeyore, each of these characters are fan favorites for good reason. While the characters aren't at their final and most well-known versions at this time, they're still very well written and fun to watch. Also from 1977, The Rescuers. What we love most about this is its style. The Rescuers is a film with plenty of interesting artistic choices when it comes to its characters and backgrounds. Characters like Medusa are designed to be terrifying in a mundane way, where she's not as physically threatening as other villains, but you could see her being a real threat. The designs of Bianca and Bernard are also interesting, and they're honestly dressed to the nine, so it's a very stylish film. Going to 1981, we have The Fox and the Hound. This movie is super underrated, and we could talk about it all day, but the thing we love most about it is its story. The story of a bloodhound puppy and a fox cub becoming friends despite their owners hating each other might not be the most original thing in the world, but despite this, it's a story that is executed amazingly. The two have a deep and believable friendship that is one of the most well-written things in Disney. Even near the end, after they are no longer friends, it's believable, and when they make up, it's even better. We now have 1985's The Black Cauldron. Much like some previous entries, we adore its darkness. The Black Cauldron relishes in its gothic story and its general dark tones. The villain and the plot are both intensely dark and includes mentions of murder and potential genocide. Sadly, much like The Fox and the Hound, it's an underrated gem and more people need to see it. Next on our list is 1986's The Great Mouse Detective. Anyone who's seen this movie knows what we're gonna choose, and that is Radigan. Radigan is a good example of an underrated but amazing Disney villain. Throughout his appearances, he chews on the scenery and makes you absolutely love him. There's no escape this time, Basil. He proves time and time again that he's an amazing villain with an even stronger villain song. Next is another underrated Disney gem, 
1988's Oliver and Company. What we love most about it is its adaptation. Like many other films created by Disney, it's an adaptation of another story, this time being the book Oliver Twist. While the story does have a lot in common with the source material, it strays in just the right places to make the film just unique enough to be a fun watch. Plus, it has just the right amount of darkness in it. We have now started the Disney renaissance with 1989's The Little Mermaid. While there's a lot of things to love about this movie, what we love the most is its music. Almost every song in the film is amazing, and it even won both Best Original Score and Best Original Song at the Academy Awards. Part of Your World, Under the Sea, and Poor Unfortunate Souls are all amazing songs, and even the worst songs are still good, so it's no surprise it's so loved. Alright, we're in the 90s. The next film on our list is The Rescuers Down Under from 1990. What we love most is its setting. Since the film takes place in Australia, it's rare to see such a location in a Disney film, and this makes it unique to see how they tackle it. It's not the most unique setting in the world, as many shows and games have utilized it, but at the time, it was unique enough that we enjoyed it. Even even if the rest of the movie seemed mediocre. Now we have 1992's Aladdin. There's so much we love, but we'll be talking about Robin Williams as Genie. Genie of the Lamp! This is especially true after the passing of Williams. Looking back at this film, he is absolutely perfect as Genie, and the character is written so well. Genie is hilarious, full of fun, and everything he does is absolutely perfect, and it's sad that we lost such a great man. Time for another classic, 1994's The Lion King. Much like the previous, there's so much to love, but we're gonna be talking about the villains, but mostly Scar. While we could prattle on about music and story and voice acting and writing, what we really enjoy is Scar and his hyenas. Because they encompass everything we've just mentioned, Jeremy Irons, Jim Cummings, Whippy Goldberg, and Cheech Marin play their roles perfectly, and they're established figures in their own right. Scar is written in the best way possible, and Be Prepared is an amazing Amazing song, so it's no surprise the villains take the show again. Next is 1995's Pocahontas. We've gone back to a movie that honestly doesn't have too much to love, but if we gotta pick something, it's the precedent she sets. Much like Snow White, we'll be talking about something outside of the film. Pocahontas is a film about a strong female protagonist who is more than capable of surviving on her own. This eventually leads to stronger films and princesses like Mulan, Tiana, and Elsa. Without this movie, it's unlikely we would have gotten such strong films and characters. Now we have The Hunchback of Notre Dame from 1996. Most consider this one of the best, and what we love most about it is its epic nature. The entire film features amazing moments, from the Hellfire and Court of Miracles songs to the death of Frollo, everything that happens is amazingly done from an art, music, and acting perspective. Despite being a relatively grounded story, it manages to show off an amazing level of heart, action, and love. Next is 1997's Hercules. Hercules has a lot of things to love, but we'll be talking about the characters. Every character, from Hercules to Meg to Hades to the Muses and everyone else, are amazing. They're written perfectly, and there are plenty of great scenes amongst them. In fact, the entirety of the characterization of Meg is perfect. We go as far as to say even the worst characters are just mediocre and not actually bad, which shows you how good it is. Next, we have 1998's Mulan. Our favorite thing is the music. While there's a lot of great things about this film, we'll be talking about the music once more. Almost every song in this movie is amazing in some shape or form. This is made more obvious by the fact that there's only five real musical numbers, and each are great. Reflection, Make a Man Out of You, and A Girl Worth Fighting For are all songs that deserve to be talked about when it comes to great Disney songs. The only drawback is a lack of villain songs from Sean Yu, but we honestly wouldn't change that. Now we have Tarzan from 1999, and yeah, it's the music. The soundtrack is iconic, and that's 100% thanks to Phil Collins who composed and recorded the entire album. The songs might not be as recognizable by name as others, but every song is lovely and fits the scene perfectly. This is due to how good of a composer Collins is, so it's no surprise. Alright, to the new millennium, with the 2000 film Dinosaur. Dinosaur only has one thing to talk about, and that is its animation. Dinosaur doesn't have a lot to talk about, but especially for the year 2000, the animation is quite beautiful. Sure, it looks a bit dated nowadays, but it still has some beauty to it. Next is another from the year 2000, The Emperor's New Groove. The film has a lot, but we'll be talking about the comedy. Every scene has a joke or two that makes you laugh out loud, even if the comedy is a little bit dated. 
Sure, not every joke lands, but almost every joke is amazing. And we don't think this film could be made without David Spade and his humor. Well, not today, pal. Uh-huh. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. 2001's Atlantis The Lost Empire is next. We love the CGI. Like we talk about with Dinosaur, while the film is made in 2001, the CGI is actually really good for its time, and it still mostly holds up today. Sure, it's not perfect, but for the most part, it's amazing what could be done at the time. It's a shame this movie's so under rated because it deserves more love. Next is Lilo and Stitch from 2002. While there's a lot to love, we'll be talking about the story. Lilo and Stitch may have come out during the so-called Disney Dark Age, but it's actually a really good film. Its story focuses on an alien experiment becoming friends, and eventually family, with a young Hawaiian girl, and the moral of the story is about family and the sacrifices you make. It's also a film about found family and how sometimes you do get to choose your family, and we think it's just a very beautiful movie because of this plot. Next is Treasure Planet from 2002. Much like another film on this list, the thing we love is the adaptation. Treasure Planet, if it wasn't obvious, is an adaptation of the book Treasure Island, which was about pirates. Adapting it to be a much more steampunk film, which includes space pirates, was a genius idea as it allowed them to expand on the ideas of the book while also making a much more interesting version of the story. Now we have the less remembered 2003 film, Brother Bear. We'll be talking about the relationship between Kanai and Koda. The entire premise of the film revolves around the idea of brotherhood, family, and love, and this is perfectly shown in the relationship between the main characters, Kanai, and the small bear, Koda. They form a realistic familial bond that ends in a self-sacrifice of Kanai's way of life to continue being there for Koda. It's an amazing part of this less-than-loved film. Now we have the forgettable 2004 Home on the Range, but we love Alameda Slim as a villain. While most of the film doesn't include him, Slim is undoubtedly the best part. He's interesting because he fits the setting amazingly, and the way he does things is actually hilarious. He may not be as terrifying or intimidating like other villains, but he fits perfectly and is hilarious in all the right ways. Now we have 2005's Chicken Little. Chicken Little is notoriously bad, but we want to talk about the voice cast. While there's not a lot to talk about, the amount of amazing actors in this cast is worth mentioning. Zach Braff from Scrubs voices Chicken Little, Joan Cusack, who voices Jesse from Toy Story 2, and Steve Zahn, who plays Frank Heffley in the Diary of a Wimpy Kid movies, play major roles. Amy Sedaris, who voices Princess Carolyn, Patrick Stewart, Patrick Warburton, Don Knotts, and Wallace Shawn all have roles as well. But the biggest star has to be Adam West, an iconic actor who has sadly passed away. This voice cast may not save the film, but it's still fun to watch. Civilization as we know it depends on me. Going to 2007, we have Meet the Robinsons. What we love most about this is the twist. Meet the Robinsons is an interesting film about family and time travel, and it features two major twists. That being that the bowler hat guy, who is the main villain of the film, is actually Goob, Lewis's roommate from the orphanage, which comes out of nowhere but makes a lot of sense. The other twist is actually pretty easy to figure out with the previous one in mind. The mysterious Cornelius that is talked about throughout the film is actually Lewis in the future, which is masterfully done. Next is 2008's Bolt. Bolt has a very interesting set of things to talk about, but we'll be talking about the plot. Bolt focuses on an acting dog who thinks he actually has superpowers. Nothing you think is real is real! The plot focuses on said dog, Bolt, trying to get back home, and is very well written, and the film utilizes this idea really well, and we love it. We're now heading to 2009 for The Princess and the Frog. While this movie is highly underrated, and we could talk about it all day, we're going to focus on its characters. While we could talk about animation and how this was the last traditionally animated mainline Disney film, we have other things to focus on. Almost every character is written perfectly, and none of them overstay their welcome, even the annoying ones. Keith Davis' Dr. Facilier is one of the best villains in Disney history, and Tiana is one of the best princesses. Even a character like Mama Odie or Louis, who are mostly there for comic relief, are great. It's even worth mentioning that some people are still broken up over the death of Rey, that people mention him to this day. Entering the most current era of Disney films, we start with 2010's Tangled. Tangled is fun, and like others on this list, we really love the adaptation. Tangled is obviously based on the story of Rapunzel, but it's much more interesting than the original story. Flynn, Pascal, and Mother Gothel are original characters and make the film 10 times better, at least in our opinion. Let's go to 2012 with Wreck-It Ralph. What we love about this film is its idea and plot. While other films and books have done the idea of crossing over into the world of video games, we feel like Wreck-It Ralph does it the best. 
focusing on the villain of a video game becoming the hero because he's done being hated by everyone. Ralph is sort of selfish, but that's sort of the point. We love how this movie came out, and this idea is amazing. Up next is 2013's mega hit, Frozen. While people consider this an overrated film, we love the story. Frozen is at its heart a story about familial love and the bond between Elsa and Anna. While a lot of the film, including Hans as a twist villain, is typically impugned, we think it's actually done well. If only there was someone out there who loved you. Most of the film has great ideas and is actually a great movie, even if it was a bit overplayed. Next is 2014's Big Hero 6. We love this movie's take on the superhero genre. This is another situation where most of the plot and story are amazing, and most of it stems from the story's usage of the superhero genre to its advantage. Everything from the death of a close family member to help the hero, to the twist villain and everything else, including the training montage, is perfect for a superhero movie. Using this diverse cast of heroes feels similar to the X-Men and helps set home the found family angle of the film. Its take on the superhero genre is well done. Now we have Zootopia from 2016. What we really love about Zootopia is its themes of racism and classism. Let's be clear, the theme of the film is not in favor of those things, they're against racism and classism, and it's obvious. The plot of the film is about Bellwether's plot to persecute those classified as predators by making them go crazy and harm people around them, essentially framing them. These themes fit the ideas of an animal society perfectly, and doesn't become too obvious while still being worn on its sleeve. Next is Moana from 2016. What we love most is its usage of Polynesian culture. Moana is the first princess movie from Disney since the amazing The Princess and the Frog to show off the culture of the princess, and it revels in it. Almost everything has some sort of reference to Polynesian culture. While some say it's not as good as it could be, it was a definite good step for representation. References to gods, real stories, and myths, and Moana being named after the Polynesian word for sea makes it really nice to us. The first sequel we'll be talking about is 2018's Ralph Breaks the Internet. Out of everything in this film, we love Penelope and the princesses. About midway through the film, Penelope goes to the Disney website and gets to meet all the princesses from Disney's history, which leads to a really lovely scene where all of them are in pajamas and enjoying each other's company, and it's very cute. Also, at the end of the film, they come back to help, and it's very nice, hence why we love it. Another sequel, 2019's Frozen 2. While this is mostly forgettable with essentially no villain, we do love the lore it revealed. While it was hinted in the first movie, the world of Frozen is based on Scandinavian mythology, and Frozen 2 really settles it. Creatures like the Jotun are explicitly mentioned, and other creatures and concepts are very well utilized. It also explained Elsa's powers, and more about their parents, and all in all, it was a very very good expansion of the story. Jumping past the pandemic and into 2021, we have Raya and the Last Dragon. Much like with Moana, we really enjoy the usage of South Asian culture. Raya's usage was very obvious, as everything is crafted with a lot of love. From the way characters interact, to the locations, to the titular dragon, everything feels perfectly aligned with the culture. And finally, we have 2021's Encanto. Almost everything in this film is worth loving, but we all know it's gotta be the music. The music is amazing, from the family magical to surface pressure, and of course, we don't talk about Bruno, has become intensely popular for good reason. In fact, unlike a lot of other Disney songs, these find themselves populating popular playlists permanently, especially after the film's re-release and the sing-along on Disney+. Plus. Alright guys, that's it. Let us know in the comment section if you agree with our ranking, and tell us what we should cover next. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our videos, but most importantly, stay wicked.